Hey everyone, <laughs> welcome to another episode of Kitchen Party. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. I, I don't know why I do that every time. I feel like it is my my MO. Welcome everyone to the show. Welcome Renee MO. Lynch. It is my MO, you're right. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, this is Kitchen Party. We are a live show on the internet. We broadcast on Google Plus and we bring the coolest people in food who are cookbook authors, winemakers, beer makers, eaters, anyone who's interested in food, we bring them to talk to you directly. And you are part of the conversation. So the way this works is that we start a conversation, and then if you have a question, you let us know. You either go to our Google event page, our YouTube channel, send us a message on Twitter by using the hashtag Kitchen Party, and you talk to us directly. And then we ask our guests any questions you want. And then if you like the show, you can share it with friends and family. Let them know to come watch the show right now because we are live. If you're watching a replay, leave a comment on our YouTube channel or on our Google Plus page, and we will get back to you if you have a question later on. Um, also, if you want to watch any of our previous episodes, you can go to our YouTube channel, which is Bake Space TV on YouTube. And uh, welcome. I am Babette Peppa. I'm the founder of Bakespace.com. And I would love to introduce my co-host, Renee Lynch. Do you want to um, tell the folks about yourself? Yes. Hey, everyone. I'm Renee Lynch. I'm a writer and editor at the LA Times. I work across a number of sections, including health and food. And I'm very happy to be here tonight to talk Renee, about wine. Are you happy to be here? Yeah, I was just going to say, because we're talking <laughs> wine. If you watch our show, you know, first of all, we drink a lot. Uh, <laughs> we drink pretty much anything. Don't even ask me about the milk and cocktails that I was I was making for a while, which Melody was making me drink every week. We're, um, we're classing it up tonight. We are classing it up because not only do we have wine, but we have a wine expert to actually talk to, you know, tell you guys, first of all, how to choose wine, what goes with the certain wine, what's great for summer uh, parties, summer pairing, uh, because the weather is hotter. You, you kind of need a little bit of a different type of wine to kind of keep with the heat and keep you cool. So I want to introduce our special guest today, which his name is Chef John, and it's Sir Rich. Is it, did I say your name right, Very Lesson? Good. Very oh, good. I practiced, I practiced. If everyone who's watched the show before you know I'm terrible with names. So that is my <laughs> disclaimer at the beginning of the show. Now John is the culinary director of St. Michelle Wine Estates. Now, Columbia Crest is one of the, the vineyards that they have, so we're going to be talking about their wine specifically, but he's actually like the big Mac Daddy of the entire company. So we are we went right to the top. So welcome, Chef John. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. Where are you, uh, where are you logging in from? Uh, from Woodenville, Washington. Uh, we're up on the west side of the state. The vineyards are on the east side of the state. We haven't had an office on the west side of the state for yeah, I want to make sure also, don't forget to talk a little bit louder too because I'm, I'm hearing you talk, but I think possibly it sounds a little bit low. So if you're watching at home, let us know. Send us a tweet if it's too low for you and we'll we'll get John to, um, to start yeah. screaming. Or, or we'll yeah. just have him start drinking. <laughs> He'll get loud if he starts drinking. <laughs> now, I think in Washington, Columbia Crest is like one of the largest vineyards, right? Yeah, it is, it is the largest vineyard in the state. Wow, that's impressive. How how big is what? What does that really mean in terms of space? Oh, in terms of space, I mean, there's a, almost ten acres of wine property, just production facility. And uh, you know, in the old days, that was like considered a monster. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily equate to the wine that they produce. When you think big, a lot of people think, eh, not so good. Well, not the case with Tommy Cross. Where can, where can folks, because I know we, we put out a thing on Twitter and we put out a um, notice on Google Plus that if people we posted a picture of the wines that we're going to be tasting today, do you know where people can usually buy these wines? Is it at the grocery store? Is it that accessible? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's really a very accessible wine. It's in almost every market, and uh, all the major stores have it. It's uh, very easy to come by. Good. Renee, have you had Columbia Crest? Yeah, I have. I have had it before, and uh, I mean, it's sold at all at all uh, my local markets. Um, John, I, I wanted to uh, just circle back because I am trying to kind of wrap my mind around how big uh, this facility is. You said ten acres for production, and does that mean ten acres of 
of Under of grapes no. of wine? No, actually, it's like a ten acre underground facility. Uh, so it's below ground grade. Uh, so all the tanks are below ground. It's obviously, the temperature control. All the barrels are down there. Uh, so uh, the amount of vineyards that we have. How many vineyards do we have? It's cute. I mean, it's in the thousands of acres that we pick and uh, produce wine from. I'm having a, just a little bit of trouble hearing that that acreage again. Uh, well, we're in the thousands of acres. Wow. Of, okay. Of yeah. Yeah. Cause I was going to say 10, 10 acres doesn't actually seem very big. Okay. Now that makes that, that makes yeah, a that's, just, that's just the wine rate. I mean, you can right. imagine. That's so cute. Right. Now, is that something that's open to the public? Like, if I if Babette and I decided to take a road trip, can we actually go and see that facility? Yeah, it's, it's an amazing facility. It's right above the Columbia River. So you're up uh, in, obviously, eastern Washington, but you're up on a, on a beautiful hill in the vineyard. And you're looking down at the Columbia River. It's just gorgeous. And there's tasting every day up there. And, uh, of course, retail room and the whole thing. And pick pretty close to that. And, and uh, for those of us who are geographically challenged, like myself, where in the state is that like where north, south, east, east, west? It'd be south. Uh, it'd be southeast of Seattle, to put it in perspective. So you'd drive about three and a half hours to get there from Seattle, and so you'd be heading down kind of southeast to the Columbia River. So about three. So if you were in Seattle, it would be kind of like a, a long day trip, but it could it could be done from Seattle. Oh yeah, it can be done from Seattle if you want a day trip. But there's lots of cute little cities around there, towns that you can stay in with bed and breakfast. I mean, there's it's a, it's a nice little trip, especially in the summertime and in the fall. It's a great place to, to vacation for a night. Did you grow up in that area? No, I grew up in Seattle, so I'm kind of more of a city boy. Uh huh. And so, how did you end up uh, at Columbia? Well, I, that's a long, long story, but I, I, <laughs> I started, started working with a company in 1976, stayed with them until 1980, and then went in my own restaurant business and like until 1990, then came back to the wineries in 1990. So I've been their point director and corporate chef since 1990. And, and be able to watch all this grow. I mean, it, the state is incredible as far as growing. So being in the restaurant business, you were probably involved quite a bit, even back then, with making recommendations for wine and, and being aware of the kind of like right kind of pairings for, for food and wine, it sounds like, no? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in a Mediterranean household, so wine was always on the table, and it was usually always grandpa's Zinfandel, right? You know, uh, but you always had wine with food, so it's, it's part of what I grew up with. And when I had my restaurants, it's the same way. When I would have special dishes, I always made sure there was wine recommendations to go with that special meat. It seems like that's something that's becoming more and more common. Uh, in in uh, restaurants, maybe maybe it's always been something that's fairly common in wine country. But uh, Babette, don't you feel like we're starting to see more recommendations on a, just as part of like a regular menu that you know this would be particularly good with this wine or absolutely. A, I, don't know if it, I don't know if it's that there's so many there's so much variety or if it's that we all feel like we want something special like a curated experience because I'm terrible at wine picking. When they when I'm at a restaurant and they hand me that wine menu and it is in French or <laughs> like whatever, I feel like an idiot. I feel like I should just like literally close my eyes and select one. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean I I I really like the, the Columbia Crest label and I, I feel like I'm one of those people who would Literally, if I was at the grocery store and I would see a label, I'd be like, "Oh, that's really elegant. That's really cool. I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna go with that one." That's probably the wrong way to approach wine. <laughs> Do you but, have any suggestions? I think that most of us are like that, Babette. That we we unless you're somebody who knows wine, you kind of are relying on those recommendations because particularly if you're going out someplace nice and you kind of want a wine, but you want that guidance. I think that's why they're showing up on menus because so many people are asking. Well, what should I order with this? What you know? What should I do? And I think it's terrific that menus are kind of helping people along. It probably also helps their bottom line too, right? Gets people to maybe think, oh, actually, I have a glass of wine with that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with both of you. I think you're absolutely right. And it's it's less intimidating when you go into a restaurant and they kind of give you a bit of a guide, so you don't look like such a schmuck, you know, staring <laughs> at this thing and not know 
A, how to pronounce it, B, what does it go with, you know, just, but uh, I see it more and more and more. It's, it's very, it's becoming very commonplace. Renee, what? I don't know, if, do, do, oh, I was going to say, do, do you know that, um, well, first of all, Chef John was named Esquire Magazine's one of the hottest new chefs and also Seattle Times top five chefs and had a cookbook, Chef in the Vineyard. So I think we're, we're dealing with somebody who's beyond, beyond expert. <laughs> so I think we've tapped into the right expert to help guide us through. Um, well, actually, actually I've got five cookbooks, and every one of them, all the recipes have wine suggestions. So, and sometimes it's white and a red because you don't want it to go with that particular dish. So, um, yeah, I really try and incorporate that into my philosophy. That's interesting. Renee, do you ever, because I always thought like red and white, like the two shall never, like only one food goes with one group and then red goes with another one. Um, do you, did you find that, Renee? Like, I think that's what the general thinking used to be, but I think that so, uh, so many winemakers now are just saying those are, those are old-fashioned rules and we're reinventing the rules, which I personally have to say I love that new trend because I'm, I'm partial to white wines. I love white. I don't care what I'm drinking, I'm eating it with. I love a white wine, in part because red, I find, can give me a headache. So I may have one or two glasses of red, but um, I can sometimes pay for it the next day. So I'm just kind of partial to white. So I want white even if I'm having a steak. I know some people would just be like, you have to have a red for steak, but I just love white wine. Is that because you like the temperature? Like you yeah. like the cool? Yeah, I like something well, a little chill. You know, I mean, that's the whole point of wine and food. Is you, you drink what you like to drink. I and mean, you don't force yourself into drinking something that just makes taste awful. Uh, and, and wine, I mean, Wine makes food taste better and vice versa. So, yeah, drink what you like. You know, speaking of the white, well, I've been to a couple of wine tastings, like up in Napa and stuff like that, and they say start with the white and then go to the red. Do you agree with that? Is that how you should do a tasting? So should we start with the white? Well, generally, because you know, most reds are going to be more powerful. They're going to be more full-bodied, so they have a tendency that if you have that first, you're not going to get the, the nuances of the white one. Now, Renee, I know you said that your husband opened your bottles, but I wanted to tell you something really funny. I decided I was going to open my open the wine bottles before the show started, and once again, on the red, I got the cork oh, used it inside, that. like an idiot. And I even used like the rabbit thing where you 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 clamp it and then you go like this, and it's supposed to just pop right out did not happen. So that, that was terrible. And then I was like, I'm going to be smart this time. I'm going to take a knife and try to cut off for the white, try to cut off the top. I'm like, it's not working. It's not working. I'm like, what happened? And then I was like, wait a second. This is a screw off. <laughs> Which means all I had to do was go like this. <laughs> so um, I think I have so definitely I love the screw top. I just I think love I, it. I think I, I won it. the award for like most idiotic wine opener ever. Um, but maybe, maybe before before we go on a little bit, maybe we should start with the with the white. I don't know if you guys want to pour yourself a little white, but I do want to check in with our folks who are listening on Google Plus and just um, give a shout out to them. Uh, Lulu Horn uh, chimed in. Kim Boltzmann chimed in as well. And then she actually said, "Columbia Chris has lovely wines. Have tried several." Went to a wine tasting event a couple years ago, and the best one was the Saint Michel Cabernet. Hmm, I think that's what we're drinking. Oh no, we're drinking the well, they were drinking the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, which which one goes best with uh, food hot off the grill? Ooh, is that a food question hot? for me? Yes, because Renee and I, we won't be able to answer that. <laughs> well, if you want to be technical, uh, what's the food that's coming hot off the grill? I mean, you know, that's the question. Uh, well, obviously, red wines with any kind of, you know, hamburger, you know, red red meats, uh, lamb, things like that, that's the one, there are lamb skewers, you know, red wine just works perfect with it. Uh, and, and the seafood, if you're doing seafood and shrimp and things like that, you want to go to white, it's, it's not so much what the protein is coming off the grill, it's what's the recipe of the protein, you know, is it Thai style, is it uh, Tex-Mex, is it, you know, Danish. I mean, you know, so you have to figure out what the flavor components of the dishes. It's not just the protein. 
That's interesting. I would have never, I usually just think of it as just the protein. Kim, if you're on Google Plus still, if you're still watching, leave us a, a, leave us a message and let us know specifically what the food type is, and then we, we can narrow that down as well. Um, yeah. Melissa Taylor, Dessert Chick, also chimed in. Francois Vill, uh, Villeneuve, <laughs> you know I cannot say your name, but you're beautiful and lovely regardless. Um, Dottie Goodman, uh, Stephen Swimmer also chimed in. Benjamin Andrews, uh, Diana Valdez, um, Renee. I had also posted some of my pi of the pictures of the wine that we're. If you're if you're wondering what wine we're drinking um, on our Google Plus event page, we have pictures of the actual wine that we're going to be drinking. Now, John, do you think we should try the the, um, the white first? Yeah, I, mean, I think I think it needs a little description before you sure. jump into taste it. This is Chardonnay from Washington State. Uh, wherever grapes grow, they, you know, they, they, they produce a different flavor into the wines, which the French call terroir. So you have the soil, the climate, what have you. Uh, Washington State has a tendency for the grapes to retain a little bit more of the grape acidity, so they're a bit crisper. That's just the growing conditions. It's not better or worse, but it's just different, right? Chardonnays, typically, the kind we drink, have a tendency to be oak. In other words, they're either fermented in oak barrels or stored in oak barrels. That's what gives that Chardonnay the butterscotch toffee, that, that luscious, rich taste of it, right? The problem with oak Chardonnays is there's a lot of foods that don't go with them, like anything spicy, anything salty, anything smoky. Well, you got a lot of gross stuff coming off of there, and those oak Chardonnays don't work as well. This is a non-oak Chardonnay. So you're really getting the flavor of the grape. You're not getting any interference from, from wood. Now, not that the oak ones aren't great. It's just that this one, an unoaked Chardonnay, like this one, uh, just goes to, to a lot more different flavored foods. No, I noticed that it actually says unoaked on, on the label here. I'll show folks right. so that they can see. Um, do the ones that are oaked, do they say oaked? Like, how will I know the difference? Usually, if, if it's unoaked, it'll be on the front label. I mean, they, they come up with all these crazy, like, naked Chardonnay, meaning no oak, things like that. Uh, but if it's non-oaked, it'll tell you. Uh, if it's oak, generally it's on a back label, and there's a little bit of a spiel about, oh, you know, eight months in French oak, and they want to tell you that because it's expensive, it's time-consuming, and that's one of the reasons you pay a little bit more for that wine because of that. So the back label is on oak Chardonnay. Usually, it will tell you what's... Yes, indeed, as well. But if it's not old, they let you know right up front, right up front, they. You know, I had no idea that a naked Chardonnay, that's what that meant. And I have to say, I really appreciate that differential because I always pick up a bottle of Chardonnay and I'm trying to figure that out from the label because my mother-in-law, who loves Chardonnay, and I like to give her as much Chardonnay as possible, <laughs> she does not <laughs> like oak Chardonnay. She does not like it, so I really have to be careful because she will look at that label and be checking it out, and so I have to be very careful about that. But now I know that naked Chardonnay also means that. But uh, so I, I appreciate that labeling up front. I was glad to see that. Did you show that right? Renee, right that was an adorable story. <laughs> <laughs> because if she's drunk, she's not yammering at me. <laughs> She doesn't watch this show, I hope. Yeah. Actually, I'm just joking. She's my mother-in-law's amazing. She's wonderful. I love her. <laughs> like backpedaling a little bit. <laughs> she knows. She laugh. If she saw this, she'd laugh. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, I mean, how long does it take for like this bottle that I'm holding in my hand? Can you tell me a little bit about the process? Like, does, is this something that takes years to create? Well. It takes years to create when it comes to growing the vine. Uh, this wine is stainless steel fermented. Uh, it's held for a while so it, it reaches sort of its flavor components it needs to be. And then it's bottled and it's intended to drink now. It's not intended to put you know any age on it because it's already fresh. And if you if you you know the old swirl and taste kind of thing when you do that. This wine, you really get the grape. And the grape in this one, you get a little bit of lemon. I get a little bit of green. You know, that's the other thing. Wine descriptors. Be careful, I mean, because a lot of times wine experts will give you descriptors of things you've never smelled or tasted in your life, so you have no idea what that smell and taste is supposed to be like. But I got a little bit of uh, lemon, a little bit of green apple in this wine. Oh, yeah, you can smell the green apple. Maybe a little mango. 
But there's no oak. You don't get the butterscotch. You don't get the toffee. You don't get any of that, which is the oak, not the grape. That's, that's, what, that's not what you're going to get in this wine, is that oak. And then if you taste it... Is that like the, when, when you have scotch? Like, because I, I drink a lot of bourbon and scotch, and when, when they have it in, like, a, like a, it's like oak in an oak barrel, it does have that, like, almost peaty kind of look. We'll get the lights back on. <laughs> more romantic here now with the wine. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it just got real. It just got real serious. Over being lit as we speak. I love all the bottles. They stayed lit though. They were. You know, there was. Well, that's yeah. Yeah. Um, no, because it smells. I think because when I love. I mean, I do. It's interesting. I love scotch, and I love the variety of scotch, and how you know things can have such a different taste by whatever it's been, um, whatever type of barrel it's been put in. Is that like the same kind of smell? That's where that yeah. oak. Yeah, that's what you get in the oak chardonnays. Absolutely. That's why you, some winemakers use uh, brand new oak barrels. Sometimes one or two year old oak barrels that is a little bit less. Sometimes French oak, American oak, Slovenian oak. Or it can be any kind of oak. But their flavor components not unlike a chef's uh, spice palette, if you will. So winemakers have the uh, the autonomy. The independence to actually create these kind of subtle differences in their wine. That's just one of them. How do they do that? What's the what's the secret? Power of what? Of, of just how they've changed the flavor so subtly. <laughs> just the well, just the barrel? Yeah, we we do some tasting. It's really interesting with the both both Chardonnays. We'll have like five different barrels. Uh, one say brand new, you know, fresh brand new oak from France. The second one, a two-year-old barrel. The third one, an American oak barrel. The fourth one, a different part of, of Burgundy, for example. All four of those Chardonnays taste different. They have a different, like one will be more, one will be more toast, one will be more butterscotch, one will be more toffee, one will be more vanilla. Uh, and it, it's just that's coming from those individual barrels. So then, I mean, so then how are you tweaking that to get the desired? Like I guess my question then would be, are you actually tweaking it to get a desired flavor, or is it what you're left with after the wine does what the wine naturally does? I'm sorry if that's a dumb question, but do you have oh. any way of impacting that outcome? Yeah, I mean, what you can do then is say if you want the wine uh, a little bit more and more vanilla in, in the, the, uh, the product, you can add some more of that vanilla oak barrel, the one that gives you the vanilla flavor. Add a little bit more of that to the blend. It's very often that all these individual barrels will be blended together uh, in a certain way to, to form the flavor you're looking for. That's not unusual at all. Does that answer your question? Yeah. No, no, no. That totally does. That totally does. I guess I, I hadn't really thought about uh, the, the hand of the winemaker in, in, uh, in, in kind of affecting the outcome at the end of the day. So it's oh, not just huge. like the luck of the draw. Yeah, no, it's huge. I mean, winemakers, I mean, they're a lot like chefs in that way. They can change the end product if they like. Uh, they're, they're looking, most winemakers will always try to strive to get the expression of the grape from the table. That's what they're really looking for. What does this grape really taste like? And then you enhance it with oak or no oak. You know, we did get a, uh, Kim came back on Google Plus and she said, Chef John, you're making me anxious to try lamb. I generally disregard the food and flavor, which wine I think will taste. Uh, I'm sorry, I got to read this better. I, di I generally disregard the food and flavor, which wine I think will taste best, often with delightful results. I hope that made sense. I really hope that made sense this time. It sounds like she's saying she's not necessarily connecting connecting the two. She's making what she likes to eat and then she's drinking what she likes to eat oh. to drink and hopefully they come together. That's, you know, that's, that's okay to do that too, but the, the, the other thing, is, it's all experimentation, you know? I mean, it's fun to do that kind of thing. And, and uh, We have people say, oh, well, you know, never, they don't eat lamb up here. We do a lot of lamb. California is obviously Sonoma lamb, you know. The, the lamb's a big thing. So the folks, but yet a lot of people won't try it because they remember their mother's mutton. You know, from 1950, they just won't go near lamb. Well, American lamb is absolutely terrific. It's sweet meat. Uh, some people get it confused with beef, even because it's so you know sweet and mild. But 
If you're not used to that, try marinating it with a little cabernet, uh, rosemary, a little garlic, olive oil, salt, and pepper. Cut them in nice big cubes, you know, put them on a skewer. And then try a wine like a cabernet because almost any red wine is going to go well with that barbecued lamb skewer. Uh, now, you may end up finding that you like Merlot better than Cab or Syrah better than the Merlot. That's the fun of this whole thing is the experimentation of finding out what you like. I love that. Now I yeah. want to go out and, uh, and, and start experimenting. <laughs> That's a great idea. So you just, so would you, how would you keep track of that? Like, would you just have a notebook or something to say the last time we tried it, we tried it with a Merlot, this time we're yeah. going to try a Syrah? I, you know, I did. I kept it in the air a long time ago. I would keep a notebook, and I would actually take off labels. Nowadays, you'll find labels are tough to get off the bottle. But I used to just put a little note next to what the wine tasted like and what food I had with it. And if you do that, you start to do it mentally. And you start to remember, oh, yeah, the Coco de Vin or the Burgundy, that was pretty cool. You, know, you just start to remember those things. Uh, but, yeah, write them down. And write down the producer. Don't forget the producer. Because even in Washington State, where, for example, uh, Cabernet is huge, right, with uh, popular varieties, a lot of wineries don't make them all the same. So you might like Columbia Press, but you might not like the other guys. So when you find one that you like, make sure you put down the vineyard to produce and kind of keep track of it that way. Kim also had another question. She says, um, she's been hearing a lot about non-oak wines, which I think is really cool recently. And what do you recommend with a tried and true grilled filet mignon? Pork chops, possibly maybe chicken. So I guess filet mignon, pork chops, chicken. She's listening. She wants to know. What do, what do you recommend with those three? Well, you know, again, let's just assume it's a simple preparation so we don't have to get all hung up in the recipe of the dish. But at, at filet mignon, uh, it's really the, one of the milder of the, the cuts of steak, right? But it's still beef, and I would still do a nice big cabernet. I think that just goes great. Uh, one of the periodicals, I think it was last year, uh, someone, one of the writers had wrote an article about white wines with barbecued meats. And there you go into the bigger flavored food, the bigger flavored wine. So if you're going to have a white wine and egg with a steak, go for a big Chardonnay. Get something with some really backbone to it if you really want to have white with that, that filet mignon. But if you're not used to reds, you're not used to big reds, this is the time to experiment. Take that grilled filet mignon. If you've got the charcoal flavor going on, which is wonderful, that, that goes with red wine. And then that richness of the meat with that big cab is the perfect time to try it. You know, if you haven't had it before, try it with the Cabernet. Uh, the pork and the chicken, I'd almost have to find out what a recipe is. But then you can get into uh, the unoaked Chardonnay to be great. Other unoaked wines, something like long, two, three, things like that. But the unoaked Chardonnay, the pork and uh, chicken, no matter how it's done, even if it's Thai spicy, it's going to work with that unoaked Chardonnay. Mm. You know, two things. Oh, there, so we have some questions on Twitter, but I feel like this wine is making me, um, it's like I'm warm. <laughs> like I feel i feel good. I don't know if, it's, if I've been drinking a little bit too much, but it's making me feel good. So Eric Deutsch wants to know, he says, what is the primary difference between California and Washington State wine country? Well, it, it, in general, now again, because there's so many different microclimates, both Washington and California, but if you, I mentioned this earlier, if you take eastern Washington, as a general rule, because of our vineyards, because of our weather that we have, we have very warm days and very cool nights, the grapes have a tendency to hold on to more of the grape acidity. So the finished wine, it's not acidic, it's just a little crisper. So if you compare Washington Chardonnay, let's say, with Napa Chardonnay, Napa makes more, it's very lush Chardonnay, but they don't contain the acidity that you get in Washington. And again, that's not better or worse, it's just different, and that's also fun. They're different. So that's made, I think, mainly the two, the two differences. We, we have from Mel Melissa Taylor, Dessert Chick on Twitter, she wants to know, what wine would you suggest for a craft your lover who also loves desserts. Hey, um, craft beer lover. Wait, maybe a Syrah. She wants to try something big and jammy and fruit forward, and that, that kind of sounds like a craft brew drink. 
tries to run off that evening. Melissa, send, invite me over. You and I will open a bottle together. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what Melissa's drinking right now. She tweeted us a picture, Babette. She's drinking Royal Jamaican Ginger Beer. So she loves some flavor. So uh, <laughs> a, a, I think a big party yeah, for might be perfect. If she's having ginger beer, have Riesling. Try that. That would be a fun variety for her. Now, what, oh, what, what, what was that? I didn't hear that variety? The Riesling. OK. Now, Chef John, what would you recommend that would go with the unoaked Chardonnay, like for recipes? Like what? If I started, if I had this bottle in my house, and then I was thinking, well, what can I make for dinner tonight? Because we have some great wine. Um, what, do, what do you recommend I should make with that? Well, I, I'd go to seafood. You know, I'd spice up some scallops, maybe, and intersperse them with some big, huge Gulf Mexican Gulf prawns. And but don't be afraid to spice it up. Put some chili powder in there, or, or even smoke paprika and garlic and lime juice, and you give it some heat because this wine will definitely has a cooling effect to it. Um, it, it. It works really well with spicy things. So I would spice something up, and I'd kind of go to the seafood end a little bit with this one. Oh, also, although it's not always considered the time of the year, this wine with raw oysters, dynamite because no oak. If there was oak in it, it goes terrible with oysters. But with no oak, this is a great oyster wine. So generally speaking, you don't want an oak chardonnay with oysters. Is that right? Absolutely not. And why is what? Help me understand that. Why is that? What happens is you know you've got that minerality and saltiness in the oyster. Uh huh. That flavor is what reacts to the oak in the Chardonnay. It doesn't react to the grape itself. It doesn't make it negative. But it makes it, uh, it reacts to the oak in the Chardonnay. It actually makes the wine taste a bit woody. So it's a kind of a sort of a waste. Now, if you put the oyster, like say you did a, a Rockefeller, right? A little cream and spinach and that kind of thing. Now you've added a different component. You've got this richness of the cream. Yeah, now an oak Chardonnay might work okay. But a raw, raw oyster? No, go for non oak whites like the internal Chardonnay. So, how would you, if you're if you're starting out, like uh, somebody like me, I know I don't know a lot about wine pairing. Like, where do you begin? It can just seem so kind of like, oh my God, how am I going to remember all of these different subsets of what goes with what and what and what doesn't? Like, where? I mean, maybe this is a dumb question, but is there like a book that you, that you start out with? Like, where would you start? Well, actually, that's not, not. There are a number of books, of course, on the website now. You can all just type in something and it'll pop up. But uh, the Encyclopedia of Wine is great for that because it shows the regions of all the world. And they also have a little bit of uh, the Epicurean, the culinary part of it in there. And they mention about classic dishes with classic pairings. And that's a, it's a fun read anyway if you're just sitting around knocking this stuff back. And just read through the book, it's kind of fun. But there's a lot of written material. Uh, all five of my cookbooks <laughs> you can pick up, and that'll give you a lot of information. We need a little plug there, huh, Chef John? <laughs> hey, why not? hey, where can people find your cookbooks? Yeah, that's a good uh, question. Uh, actually, I, I believe Amazon.com has them. Uh, we can order them right through Saintmichelle.com, right through the winery. And that's uh, my latest is called Chef in the Vineyard. So it's different recipes from Washington, Oregon, California vineyards, and the foods are most likely being served there. Now, Chef John, is that is the last cookbook the one that you're going to be giving to the attendees of Tech Lunch uh, next week? Yes, yes, they get a copy of Chef in the Vineyard. So, Renee, I'll have to bring you an extra copy home. Uh, you know, what, I'm gonna I'm gonna find that link on uh, Amazon right now and tweet it out. Awesome. So, for those of you who are watching, um, if you're going to be heading to Tech Lunch, because we sent an email out to all, a lot of our attendees. Um, if you're going to be heading to Tech Munch next week, you are going to get a copy of that book and actually signed by Chef John, too. So, really excited about that. Um, I did, Renee, we got a tweet from Columbia Crest that said, We'd love to have you out to Western or to Eastern uh, Washington. So, I think a road trip is going to be a road right? trip. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really enjoying this, um, this white wine. So, I, uh, I, th I think maybe we should make that sooner rather than later. Um, what's your favorite part of your job? Is it tasting the wine, coming up with the recipes? What would you say is your favorite part? My favorite part, well, I've been doing food and wine for like 34 years. 
and I still stumble into things that, you know, I, I have preconceived notions. I think, oh, this won't work. And then I try it, and it's like, whew, that worked. So that's one of the funnest things. The other most fun thing is watching your guys' expression, trying something for the first time, and going, oh, my God, that didn't work. You know, I mean, that, that, that's the, really the fun thing I enjoy. Do you guys do recipe development in-house? Like, how, when you're developing your cookbooks, how do you, how do, you do that? Oh, yeah, we, we do that. Well, we're, we're constantly, with, like everybody, it's almost become cliche, you know, farm to table. I mean, how else do you get the food there? It's farm to table, so that's <laughs> what everybody does. Uh, but we, we try to stay... Uh, Seasonal and regional as much as we possibly can. Now, why should say we don't grow olives? So we obviously get our olive oil ourselves. But uh, our, for example, our spring is so short and tight that the morels just pop, the raspberries just pop, the strawberries just pop. They don't last for a long time. Cherries are out now. So, and that of course the seed, the halibut's out. Uh, the salmon run is terrific this year. We've got sockeyes and kings and halibut cheeks and. Uh, just the uh, spot prawns and you know, all this stuff. So our beginning of our spring is when all the chefs just go nuts because everything is just coming out like crazy. So we try to uh, do all our menus based on that seasonality and regionality. Do you find that people have a lot of misconceptions with uh, wine and food pairing? Yeah, and some people are just stuck in it, you know. I mean, it, it, and then that's okay too. If all you, we were talking about this earlier, if all you want to drink is Cabernet, then Go ahead and drink it. If you're going to have it with prawns, I guarantee you that Cabernet will taste like metal. But uh, my, I was told the story, my uncle Tony, the old country guy, he's got a, it's like from the Sopranos, and he come to the house and only drink red wine. And at Christmas time, I got prawns and lox, you know, the cured fish, that makes that wine taste terrible. He didn't care. He didn't come for the food. He came for the wine. So you, you, you kind of just drink what you're going to drink. But, uh, so I think it's it's fun and it's educational and you can do it yourself. You don't need to have some pro telling you. Um, and sometimes just go and grab a bottle and, and throw something together and see how that works. And that can be fun do, you, do you think that this this um, this Chardonnay would be good because, um, you know, during summer you're entertaining and people are outside and there's all yeah. different types of foods and especially foods where you're like you're barbecuing and stuff. Would you say that this would be like a go-to wine for oh. being able to kind of Go with almost everything that you have on your yeah, table. Absolutely. I mean, anything from you know shrimp and avocado salad to it, it's almost like Riesling. Riesling is always known for a wine that can go with anything. I know Chardonnay is really the kind of the same thing. It just seems to go really well. And another thing you can do with Unoak Chardonnay because it's a very clean flavor is go ahead and do like a rich cream sauce sometimes, like a lot, just for lack of a better term, lobster thermidor, right? You know, really rich and creamy. Now, normally I would go a rich and creamy Chardonnay, but why not go the other way and get a nice, crisp, light Chardonnay? And that works really well, too. It just works in a different way. You, you mentioned uh, Rieslings earlier, too. I have to say, before tonight, I think I thought of those as almost being like, like a very sweet, almost dessert-type wine. But apparently that's not the case. Me, too. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, not to go too far into Rieslings, but I, I, Riesling... It's the one grape that you can make from bone dry to syrupy sweet. One of the only grapes that can actually do that. Um, and we grow a lot of Riesling up here in Washington State. Uh, the drier the Rieslings are the better of the food wines, I think. Uh, in Germany and the Mosul and the Loire, you'll find a whole spread of, again, dry to sweet. But for the most Americans, I think we got used to what we call the picnic Riesling, which is always mid-sweet and above. Well, now we're producing wines that have good structure, uh, good acidity. They're, uh, I wouldn't call them bone dry, but when you have them with food, they dry out really nice. The acidity comes up, and they're a great food. So you see them more and more of those. So is it the same grape that's making both wines, or are they two varieties of grapes? But for the Riesling, you mean for dry and sweet? Just just for just for any wine, is it is it is there like a, a like a like a like a um, 